evening, First Baptist. How is everybody? If you are wondering, you're looking around going, where did everybody go? They're recovering from Disciple Now. Uh, is what they're doing. This is Disciple Now weekend. For those of you who do not know, we had over 300 of our teenagers. And by the way, if you don't know this, if you're a teenager, you're connected to some of our parents too. Uh, so you had those entire families involved in a very sleepless, incredible, energetic weekend. Also, just to remind you, next Sunday night begins our regular Sunday evening activities other than our service. We'll have children's choir, our student ministry, small groups, etc. Uh, so, that being said, if you have a preferred place to sit on Sunday night, this is the week to claim it, all right? Uh, because next week there could be a little competition uh, for where you like to sit. But nonetheless, we are grateful that you have braved the great snowzilla of Opelika, Alabama, 2022. I'm grateful you are here, that you made it, you survived, and we have the privilege of worshiping together. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, tonight as we gather in this place, Lord, whether it is the physical exhaustion just of life and even ministry, Lord, whether it is just the, the toil of the elements that are outside, God, thank you in spite of all that, that you've allowed us to be in this place, Lord, you've allowed us to be among the, the saints of faith, Lord, you've allowed us to have the technology to broadcast literally all over the world. So God, tonight, uh, though time and distance uh, does not affect you like it does us, help us to have your perspective. Help us to see what you see, to hear what you hear, and literally, Lord, to join the heavenly host in singing your praise and becoming confident in your word. Lord, we love you. Thank you for tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please stand as we sing, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee. Joyful, joyful, we adore Thee, God of glory, Lord of love. Hearts unfold like clouds before Thee, opening to the sun above. Melt the clouds of sin and sadness, drive the dark of doubt away. Giver of immortal gladness, fill us with the light of day all thy works with joy surround thee earth and heaven reflect thy rays stars and angels sing around thee center of unbroken praise field and forest vale and mountain flowering meadow flashing sea Singing bird and flowing fountain, call us to rejoice in thee. Thou art giving and forgiving, ever blessing, ever blessed. Wellspring of the joy of living, ocean depth of happy rest. us to the joy divine. Oh, worship the King, all glorious above, and gratefully sing His wonderful love, our shield and defender, the Ancient of Days, pavilion in splendor and girded with praise. Oh, tell of his might, oh, sing of his grace, whose robe is the light, whose canopy space, his chariots of wrath, the deep thunder clouds form, and dark is the path on the wings of the storm. All hail to the King in splendor and throne. Let praises we bring, thy wonders make known. Returning victorious, great conqueror of sin, King Jesus of all this white tree will win. Have 
faith in God when your pathway is lonely. See seas and those all the way you have trod. Never alone are the least of his children. Have faith in God. Have faith in God. Have faith in God. He's on his throne. Have faith in God. He watches o'er his own. He cannot fail. He must prevail. Have faith in God. Have faith in God. Have faith in God when your prayers are unanswered. Your earnest plea. He will never forget. Wait on the Lord, trust His word and be patient. Have faith in God, He'll answer yet. Have faith in God, He's on His throne. Have faith in God, He watches o'er His own. He cannot fail, he must prevail. Have faith in God, have faith in God. Have faith in God, though all else fail about you. Have faith in God, he provides for his own. He cannot fail, though all kingdoms shall perish. upon his throne have faith in god he's on his throne have faith in god he watches o'er his own he cannot fail he must prevail have faith in god have faith in Why should I feel discouraged? Why should the shadows come? Why should my heart be lonely and long for heaven and home? When Jesus is my portion, a constant friend is he. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. I sing because I'm happy. I sing because I'm free. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. Let not your heart be troubled, his tender word I hear, and resting on his goodness, I lose my doubts and fears. Though by But one step, step I see, his eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. I sing because I'm happy. I sing because I'm free. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. Whenever I am tempted, whenever clouds arise, when songs give place to sighing, 
Pray with me, please. Father, just what a privilege it is to come before you, to worship before your throne, to see you high and exalted, and to know you care about us. Father, we praise you. We thank you. We thank you for the opportunity to participate in your work and just pray that you would take these offerings tonight and use them for your glory, we pray it in Christ's name. Amen. I dreamed I crossed to heaven's side and angels said I'll lead you through this land so vast, and I will save the best for last, the mansions bright, the golden stream. Were greater signs than I had dreamed. But when I gazed upon his throne, I was amazed by what I saw. For I saw a pile of crowns laid before the Holy Lamb, one by one, the same. Gains on earth were now as lost. These crowns I'd earned, I wasn't worthy of, but I made my Savior smile.
one by one the saints had come to thank the Lord for all he done no greater sight in heaven I found No greater sight in heaven I found than the holy God and a pile of crowns. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, what a humbling, humbling thought. That pile of crowns. Lord, we know from your word that there is coming a day where this mortal body will expire and we will stand before you and you alone. Lord, you've made it very clear in your word that all that which we have aspired for and desired in this very temporal, earthly place will expire in the flames of fire. But that which is done on your behalf, that which is honoring to you and glorifying to you, shall remain. Lord, may tonight's study in your word not only be fruitful in your eyes, but Lord, may it prepare us to be even more fruitful tomorrow when we rise. It is in the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. This evening, I want to encourage you to open your Bibles to the Gospel of Matthew chapter 1. And if by chance you were not with us last week, we are beginning a journey through the Gospel of Matthew that will do multiple things in our lives. Uh, First and foremost, it will help us, it will assist us, not just in learning the Gospel of Matthew, not just in learning the first part of what you know as your New Testament, but it will allow us to take all of Scripture, and essentially what we're doing is learning the totality of the Bible by simply walking through the Gospel of Matthew. I realize that it's 28 chapters in length. I realize that we're going to go at what we might call a snail's pace. But as I said last week, I promise, if you will just, quote, hang in there with me, whenever this journey ends, you're going to look back and not just have learned the Gospel of Matthew, We will have learned the entirety of Scripture. We will have kind of created that biblical jigsaw puzzle where all the pieces come together tonight. We come to probably one of the most exciting passages in all of your Bible. Matthew chapter 1, the genealogy of Jesus Christ. Now, for the sake of your sanity and mine, I'm not going to read verses 1 through 17. However, I am going to read verses 1 and 2 and then fast forward to verse 17. It says, The book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham begat Isaac, and Isaac begat Jacob, and Jacob begat Judas and his brethren. Fast forward to verse 17. And so all the generations... From Abraham to David are 14 generations. From David unto the carrying away into Babylon are 14 generations. And from the carrying away into Babylon unto Christ are 14 generations. As you will see tonight, this section of scripture contains the famous begats. This is the genealogy. This is the historical ancestry.com of Jesus Christ. And often this is one of those sections I must confess that when you're in any type of Bible reading plan, we either A, skim over it, or B, just skip this section because it's a bunch of names that honestly we have difficulty pronouncing. And at the same time, we really want to get to the next story. The next story is Christmas. And the next story is the birth of the Savior. And we know he got here. We know about all these names. So tonight, for the sake of, of just a continuance of our study, 
I want to walk through this genealogy to see the significance of what is laid out before us. But to begin with, somewhat of a reprise last week, but really just an introductory matter. Let us remember that what we know is the Gospel of Matthew contains a very unique perspective. The Lord utilized a tax collector, a publican, a, a modern-day tax official, uh, someone who would have been very interested in the specific names that were involved in the process of the coming of the Messiah. Allow me to illustrate. Imagine this spring as you're doing that glorious endeavor of filing your taxes. And it asks you on your taxes because it is critical to the equation, how many dependents do you have? And you just said, a whole bunch. How would that go with an IRS auditor? Not very well. In fact, they want the names of the dependents. They want the social security numbers of the names, the ages, etc. Why? Because you're not able to cross-claim and all those different accounting terms. The reason this is so important is from the perspective that the Lord used through a modern-day accountant, a public in his day, is that there's probably no chapter that we find less palatable, but yet is more specific. It doesn't say a certain place at a certain time there was a certain person born. We are given names. We are given details. We are given the very specifics. But what does this do? It transitions us. You realize the first 17 verses of Matthew cover almost 2,000 years of human history with all of these names. It's almost as if everything from Genesis chapter 12 with the call of Abram unto the birth of the Messiah is summed up in these simple lists of names. Three things that Matthew, quote, transitions uh, for us. It takes us from the Old Testament to the New. Remember last week we discussed 430 years of silence, that blank page in your Bible. Now that which has been expected, that which has been desired, that which has been prophesied is about to be revealed unto us. It's also going to transition us from Judaism to what we know as the church and the body of Christ. Every name we're about to read with the exception of a few, we'll discuss that in a moment, are from Abraham's lineage. They are Jewish, yet what do we discover? By the time you get to the letters of the Apostle Paul, the majority of the places he wrote to, the majority of the people who heard him had a Gentile background for, them, for their specific genealogy. So Matthew is not just taking us from the Old Testament to the New. It's not only taking us from Judaism unto the Gentiles, but it is all, from Judaism to the church, but it is taking us from the Jews to the Gentiles. What we're going to discover in the book of Matthew, not just the list of these names, but throughout the entire text, is that the overwhelming majority of every miracle Jesus performed, every message he spoke, was rejected by the Jewish people. He did not look the way they wanted him to look. He did not act the way they wanted him to act. And so therefore, who was it that was so receptive to him. Those that society had pushed to the outer skirts, those that were the Samaritans, those that were the Gentiles. So just as an introduction, Matthew again serves as an incredible transition. Here we have almost 2,000 years of history wrapped up in 17 verses. Pretty interesting statistics, at least I consider them interesting here in chapter one. Number one, there are 45 names that are listed in this genealogy. I jokingly say there are those of a royal background, there are those that we would call the relatives of Jesus, and then there's what I like to call the renegades. We'll discuss that in a moment. You kind of wonder, how did they get in the list? There are 42 generations. Now, verse 17, uh, it makes it very clear that there are 14 generations, from Abraham to David, from the David to the carrying away into Babylon, from Babylon into the time of Christ. Uh, you're probably most likely familiar with this, but if you go home tonight and you try to reconcile chronologically those three sets of 14 generations, you will not sleep and you will wake up mad is what you will do. And when I say mad, you're either going to be frustrated or you're not going to be thinking properly. When you go back, what you'll discover is that oftentimes in the biblical record, even if you're a great-grandson of somebody, 
the Bible will refer to you as a son of. So oftentimes the chronological generations may be skipped over, but the fact that that name is listed is still a direct connection between the original ancestor and the one that is mentioned. And we'll see later, there's a specific reason that the Lord laid it out in these three tribes. There's a specific reason there is 14 generations in totality. There are 40 what I call begats. Those of you like myself, who are a fan of what we know as the old King James Version, so-and-so begat so-and-so that begat so-and-so. Here's why that is fascinating to me. Do you recognize that nobody in Matthew chapter 1 in the genealogy, nobody dies? Now, we all know that over time their earthly lives expired. But there are nine genealogies in your Old Testament, beginning in Genesis chapter 5. We have the the lineage of Adam. We have the descendants of Cain. We have the descendants of Seth. Then we make our way uh, through the Jewish people all the way through the Old Testament. Here's what you would typically see in an Old Testament genealogy. So-and-so lived such amount of years. After that amount of years, uh, they gave birth to a child. And a hundred and X number of years later, they died. I mean, every genealogy, they died. They died. They died. They died. You've got 42 generations, 45 names, and nobody is mentioned as dying. Now, we know that from an earthly perspective, they did physically expire. But what we have from the very beginning of Matthew is this very subtle communication that Jesus Christ has come to give us life. Death is not even mentioned in the very genealogy that introduces his life and his ministry. The next little statistic is there are two kingdoms that are represented in the gospel of Matthew. As we progress, we will spend more time on these, but allow me just a a few brief moments. Two phrases that you will see in the gospel of Matthew that you will not see in any of the other three gospels together. There is what we know as the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God. Now, the Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 2 that we should study to show our proof unto God, rightly dividing the word of God. One of our problems in our culture and our society is we like to take two things that are incompatible and smash them together and force them uh, to work. We, we use it all the time in a simple analogy, okay, that we're comparing apples to oranges, all right? We would never say that an orange is an apple. We'd never say an apple is an orange. Two different colors, two different textures, two different tastes, et cetera, correct? Well, when you come to the Gospel of Matthew, 33 times the phrase, the kingdom of heaven is going to be utilized. Now tonight, we not only sang, but we heard about the glories of heaven. Illustrations of mansions, Streets of gold, etc., crowns in piles. All of that is its material in the sense of you can see it, uh, you can touch it. But then there's this phrase, the kingdom of God. In John chapter 4, verse 24, it says, God is spirit, and we must worship him in truth and in spirit. Remember, last week we talked about the Abrahamic covenant, that it was twofold. Uh, there was this physical aspect of of the ground, the land, the covenant of that which he'd given them to dwell in. And there was also the covenant of the heart, the relationship that they would be his people and he would be their God. In a very simplistic fashion, the kingdom of God is our relationship to the Lord and the kingdom of heaven is his reigning upon the land that he covenanted with Abraham, David, etc. Why is this critical? The phrase kingdom of heaven is not found in the gospel of Mark, Luke, and or John. It's not there. In fact, those gospels contain an abundance of the phrase the kingdom of God. In the gospel of Matthew, we do have five references to the kingdom of God. But as we walk through Matthew, uh, we'll spend more time kind of differentiating this. But what I want you to see statistically is there's an overwhelming emphasis on the 
physical kingship of Jesus Christ. An overwhelming emphasis of that which he prophesied, that which he promised, and one day in his return, he will fulfill. Last but not least, when it comes to statistics, there is only one king. There can only be one king. And we see the gospel of Matthew as demonstrating the path, uh, the, 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 the pathway by which he is incarnated and born. He lives, he dies, he raises from the dead, and yes, returns. In fact, the gospel of Matthew will spend two entire chapters on what we collectively call the second coming of Jesus Christ. There is more in Matthew about his second coming than the famous Christmas story that is contained therein. And so when we start looking at these statistics, what we see is there's an overwhelming evidence that the gospel of Matthew is showing itself to be the fulfillment of, the manifestation of all these Old Testament prophecies that have been spoken throughout the years. Now, let's get to the specific names. This is where, in my opinion, it gets pretty intriguing when you begin to look at who is not in the list versus who is in the list. Let's begin with royalty. There are three individuals that are mentioned in this list that we must address. They are just commonplace names within our faith. We must begin with Abraham. Obviously, it states in verse 1 that he came from Abraham. Verse 2 mentions him again. This is the initiation of what we might call the seed. Back in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, we call this verse the very first gospel or the proto-evangelum. Remember, humanity has fallen into sin. We're trying to hide ourselves from God. We're trying our best with fig leaves. Things aren't working out. Finally, with an audience of the Lord, he begins to lay out the consequences of our rebellion. There in verse 15 of Genesis 3, he says, Behold, the seed of the woman will crush the head of the serpent. That is, by not only uh, my observation, but many, the very first mention of this concept, of this idea, that a messianic figure, a messiah, a redeemer, will come from humanity to save us uh, from our sins. In fact, I find it intriguing that the very next chapter, when Adam and Eve give birth to their first child, Interesting what Eve refers to him. She says, I have received a man-child of the Lord. Can you go back and just almost wonder if they were thinking, would he be the one? Would the very first human being born out of natural process be the one? And yet he would be the antithesis of the one, the one whom we know as Cain. We fast forward to chapter 12 of Genesis. The Lord comes to Abraham. And he says, I know you and your wife are well past the childbearing age, but if you believe me and you're willing to go to a land you've never seen and you're willing, according to the book of Romans, to perform as I ask you to, then you will have a child of promise. That child would be whom we know as Isaac. Isaac is also mentioned in this list. Why is he so critical? You know, Isaac, if you think about it, Really, it's just kind of the peanut butter and jelly between the two loaves of Abraham and Jacob. I mean, Abraham is whom he started the covenant with. Jacob is who he would rename Israel. And then there's Isaac. The only thing he's really known for is the fact that he should have died, didn't die, but Abraham believed he could come back from the dead. It was the picture of his potential death that gives us the picture of what the Messiah's ultimate mission is would be. It's there on the mountain of Genesis 22 when him being placed upon that altar, Abraham raising his hand, the angel of the Lord intervening, the ram coming out of the thicket that connects the Abrahamic covenant to whom we know as Jacob that would be renamed Israel who would have a tribe named Judah whom Jesus Christ would descend from. And then of course there is David. Notice I called Abraham the calling, Isaac the connection, but David was a contract. We looked at this last week in 2 Samuel chapter 7. 
that the Lord made a covenant about his kingdom, made a covenant about the throne, made a covenant that is called everlasting regarding his reign. And so here we have this significant group of people that are mentioned in the lineage of Jesus Christ. Now that's interesting because you've got 45 names, but very few of them are what we might call of great promise. Now let's address that aspect not just of Jesus' lineage, but our own. Let's talk about the relatives. You know, that's always an interesting conversation to have with someone when it comes to the relatives. I know that people will come to me oftentimes, I find it humorous. They'll say, Pastor, can I talk to you about kind of my family issues? I know that you don't have any of this in your family. Which is ironic because what do we discover? That we all have got the same issues, correct? We've all got the crazy uncle. We've all got that cousin. We've all got that, quote, person in our lives. I think it's interesting that not only the 45 names, there are three very specific people that are mentioned in the lineage of Jesus Christ. The first one I want to deal with is what I call the relative of open sin. There in verse 5, it says that Rahab. Do you find that intriguing that Rahab made the genealogy of Jesus Christ. Here is this woman. Remember the famous spies of the Old Testament hid themselves in her house. Remember her request? She said, please, just will you come when you destroy? Rescue me. Remember what was to be outside of her window? It was a scarlet thread. Rahab, an individual that was known as a woman of ill repute and less than stellar reputation, actually makes the genealogy of Jesus Christ. Not only does she make the genealogy, but I reference for you Hebrews chapter 11. You know the famous Hall of Fame of Faith? In the Hall of Fame of Faith, Rahab gets her own verse. I mean, David doesn't even get a verse in chapter 11. She gets her own verse. Why is this so important? Because not only is the genealogy of Jesus Christ connecting us from that Abrahamic covenant into that manger scene that we celebrate at Christmas, it's also showing us that there are those who openly defied and rebelled against God, and it did not stop his plan, and he was willing to include them if they were willing to repent of their sin. Rahab had open, blatant, everybody knew about its sin. And then there's also hidden sin, Bathsheba. Now, she makes the lineage the genealogy, but in a very subtle way. Notice verse 6. It says, And Jesse begat David the king, and David the king begat Solomon of her who had been the wife of Uriah. She doesn't make it by, quote, name, but I think every single one of us knows exactly who she is. She was that woman in 2 Samuel chapter 3. When the Bible says that when kings went out to war, David stayed home. He saw her in the moonlight that evening. He so desired her personally, physically, was willing to have her husband killed, to lie, to cheat, to steal, and eventually the child would die an early, untimely death. When Nathan the prophet, led by God, confronted him regarding his hidden sin, what we know as Psalms 51 was inspired by God and written by the hand of David where he spoke of over 30 times about his personal sin against God. Bathsheba. I mean, the lineage of Jesus Christ, not only is this the first lineage not to mention death, it's also the first lineage to mention women, and if you include Rahab's beginning, it's the first one to have a Gentile of all the genealogies, we see that Jesus' genealogy is not just for a specific group, specific section, but for all of humanity in our ills. Open sin, hidden sin, and then what I want to refer to tonight as permanent sin. You know, one of the things that not only do I share in a context like this, but my wife and I regularly with our own children is that we get the privilege of choosing our sin. We don't get the privilege of choosing the consequences. We can choose what to do and to how to rebel against God, but we don't get the privilege of, of delegating the consequences. 
One of the things that, that I do within my own home, you may or may not appreciate or approve of this, but it's, it's my house, is I have a very simple rule. Now that I, by the way, this is a blessing of God. You know, when I was younger, all I prayed for is that my boys could go to the bathroom, feed themselves, and dress themselves. I'd be happy. As they got older, I was like, please, God, let them pass their driving test. Please. Now that I have all drivers, it's a wonderful, wonderful day in the Myers house. But one of the things that I've shared with them is if they decide to be reckless, if they decide to not pay attention or uh, to work in, in somewhat of an unsavory fashion, we have an agreement on, on the gas and the insurance and such, but I've told them, here's the consequence, that if you do something stupid enough to increase the rate of your insurance, you are paying the difference. That is the consequence. But I've also told them this, that if you do something so stupid that it goes beyond even an insurance rise, you can't get it back. We all know that there are some actions that are done that the consequences are so literally grave, you don't get a do-over. You don't get a second chance. It's a permanent consequence, which is why I bring up Jeconiah. Verse 11 of Matthew chapter 1, it says, And Josiah beget Jeconiah and his brethren about the time that they were carried away to Babylon. Now, it seems like a pretty innocent verse. It's not a good verse or a happy verse, but it just talks about this guy begets this guy, and it is what it is. Jeconiah is mentioned back in the book of Jeremiah. Jeconiah was such a wicked man. The Lord had had enough. And here's what he said about Jeconiah's rebellion. He said, render this man childless. So nobody from his genealogy will sit on the throne of David. Speaking of that messianic throne. And yet when you read verse 11, we've got six verses left. We got a bunch of more names that are coming up. And so not only do we have Rahab who, who had some pretty open sin, not only do we have Bathsheba had some hidden sin on David's part, we got a guy where God basically says, I'm wiping my hands and I am done. Can I go back to Genesis 3.15? For the seed of the woman will crush the head of the serpent. I was not a biology major. I had a football coach that taught me biology, but he knew enough to teach me this, that when it comes to the normal genealogies of life, the seed of the woman is not how it naturally works. What the Lord was saying is this would be a supernatural birth. We refer to it obviously as the virgin birth. That it would not be a physical blood lineage of Jeconiah who would be qualified to be the Messiah. It would be the, the Lord himself incarnated supernaturally. And then finally, the reason. You ever wondered, why do we have this chapter? I mean, yeah, there's some interesting names, some interesting scenarios here. But at the end of the day, it's just kind of a list of names that, yeah, there's stories behind all of them. But why did the Lord seem fit to give us 17 verses of names? First and foremost, it's a picture. It's a picture of God's plan through time. One of the things that I love about Old Testament prophecy, one of the things I love about Matthew chapter 1, is the Lord stated in the beginning how it was going to go, and no deed of man was going to thwart his plan. I mean, think about it. Who's the first guy he called in the equation? Abraham. You do remember that the first child that he had was not a part of the plan. In fact, you could, from our perspective, we look at God's plan and go, wow, we have derailed quickly. But God said, nope, I've put a plan in place. And Abraham, even if you and Sarah concoct this plan with Hagar, it will not deter Isaac being the child of promise. And Jacob, even though you're a mama's boy and you and your brother have all kinds of issues, it is still not going to deter my plan. And David, even though you are at the wrong place at the wrong time doing the wrong thing with the wrong person, it is not going to deter my plan. And Solomon, even though you started out good, but you decided you needed all those women and all their idols, it will not deter my plan. And Jeconiah, even though your wickedness was so bad 
that I refuse to let anybody sit on the throne from your little genealogy. It will not stop my plan. The testimony of Matthew chapter 1 is that our sin is not big enough to stop God's plan to save us. That no matter if it's open, if it's hidden, if it's permanent, he says, I started it, I'm going to finish it. Secondly, it's a prophecy. I know you expect to hear that, particularly in light of all the Old Testament statements that were made through the lives of Abraham and David and such. But in the book of Matthew, there are going to be so many references to the temple. The temple where sacrifices are offered. The temple where the celebrations, where where the Passover and all these significant events are going to take place. But what do we see? That by the time we get to the end of the Gospel of Matthew, the temple that is of the greatest significance is not that building on a mount in Jerusalem. It is the temple of the Holy Ghost that becomes available through the resurrection of the Messiah, Jesus Christ, and our belief upon him. See, as we walk through the Gospel of Matthew, one of the things that we discover from the very beginning is that God had a plan that he was going to fulfill, and no scheme of hell or plan of man was ever going to deter. And it ends with one solitary person, Jesus Christ, as the fulfillment of all things. One of the statements, one of the phrases that we see over and over and over and over in the Gospel of Matthew is, as it was written, as it was written. And when you begin to go back in the Old Testament and you begin to look at that which was written, It actually helps us understand why the Pharisees and the scribes and all these guys got so sideways. Now, don't get me wrong. They had taken Scripture and they had twisted it and turned it uh, to propagate their own personal agendas. We know that. But I know you've asked this question. How is it that a group of Jewish people that, according to the book of Romans, had grown up with the Scripture their whole life, how is it? that these men and even these women who had grown up in the synagogue hearing these scriptures time and time and time again, when the Bible said he'd be born in Bethlehem and Jesus was born in Bethlehem, when the Bible says he'd come out of Egypt and Jesus came out of Egypt, when the Bible said he would be a Nazarene, he came out of Nazareth, when the Bible said all these things, how did they miss it? It's because when you go back in the Old Testament and you start looking at those Old Testament prophecies, oh yes, There is the passage about being born in Bethlehem. There is the passage about coming out of Egypt. There's the passage in Zechariah that he will come in on that that famous cult at at, at what we know as Palm Sunday. There's all those passages. But do you know how many there are? 43, or 48, I'm sorry. There are 48 of those passages that regard his birth, his life, his death, and his resurrection. Significant number. But do you know how many we have in the Old Testament about him coming back as a king? Conservatively, 300. If you want to be a little more open-minded, up to 800. So if you do the math and you just keep it real simple and vague, for every passage that says that Jesus is going to come and live and die and, quote, raise from the dead, we've got at least 10 that say he's going to come sit on the throne until those that are his enemies are placed under his feet. Now do you see why it would be difficult? Now do you see why even though they grew up going to the synagogue, they're going, what about the other hundreds of prophetic statements? I want to reread what I put on the screen tonight. Jesus Christ as the fulfillment of All things, not just the throne, not just the kingship, which is most assuredly true. But as it has been said by those that are wiser than I, that you cannot put the crown of king of kings on Jesus' brow until he has worn the crown of thorns. 
And they, like we, have this often propensity to, quote, skip to the good stuff. You know, one of the blessed curses of today's technology, and I don't know if this is a part of your life, I know it's a part of my home, is that whatever, quote unquote, television program we may or may not be watching, that thanks to technology today, most of it is what we call streamed, which allows you to do what? Fast forward. I'm telling you, I can get through an hour show in six minutes. I can do it. Because, and by the way, and please, ladies, do not get upset with me. I don't even have to watch the Hallmark movie. I know the story. It's real simple. But what do you do? You have this propensity to skip through the details, skip through the stuff that you know has to be a part of the dialogue and story, and let's get to how it ends. You realize that's what the, quote, enemies of Jesus did. They skipped all the way to the second coming prophecies and said, all right, here's the place. Here's the throne. But Jesus said, no, you don't understand. I've got to go through the crown of thorns first. I've got to go to the cross first. And by the way, do you see these names? All these names represent someone who struggled with sin. Some was open, some was hidden, some was permanent. And if I don't come and offer myself for the sins of humanity, then it doesn't matter if I come and sit upon a throne for your sake for all of eternity. The Gospel of Matthew, though primarily about the kingdom of heaven, though primarily about Jesus as king, though primarily as him coming to reign, even in the first chapter, does not leave out the fact that sinful humanity, both male and female, both Jewish and Gentile, were a part and the reason for his coming. We cannot bypass the fact that he wasn't just the fulfillment of the second coming prophecies, but he was the fulfillment of all things. Every one of these names represents a story. Every one of these names represents a struggle with humanity. Every one of these names represents the human sin condition that Jesus Christ came to be willing to give his life in a sacrifice for and ultimately one day come and reign over. And so, list of names, there's 45. Generations, 42 and 40 begats. But there is one Messiah, one King Jesus, who not only sits on the throne for all of eternity, but offered himself to sit on the throne of our hearts. Let us pray with our heads bowed, our eyes closed. Maybe tonight, even though it's Sunday evening, even though uh, it's one of those inclement weather nights, maybe tonight's that night here in person, or maybe online, where the Spirit of God got a hold of the Word of God, even through a list of names. And maybe the Spirit communicated to you that you're one with open sin, hidden sin, or maybe from a human perspective, permanent sin. And maybe tonight the Lord has said, you know, I I can take care of that, though you can't fix it. And maybe you'd be willing to admit, you know, I've tried tried to manage my sin. I've tried to somehow disguise it. I've, I've tried to to pretty it up. I've tried to make it not as bad as it really is. And maybe tonight, the Word of God showed you real clearly through these individual names that only Jesus Christ can take care of this. Maybe tonight's the night where you you call it what it is and you cry out to be saved. Maybe tonight you say, I'm already saved, but maybe tonight's about restoring that fellowship and coming clean before the Lord. All I know is that tonight, our name may not be in that list. But there is a name in that list that represents who we are. Jesus Christ came on behalf of all of us, for all of us, in spite of us. May tonight be that night that we render whatever decision necessary on his behalf. Heavenly Father, tonight, God, even though the stories are difficult at times to recount, God, thank you. Thank you that you worked in people's lives to show us that you'll work in ours. God, thank you that humanity's best efforts at thwarting your plan, Lord, weren't going to manifest themselves. That, God, that you came 
You conquered death so that we could be in a right relationship with you. God, help us tonight. Lord, if not there, help us, Lord, to call upon you. For those of us who have called upon you, help us to walk out of here in the power of your spirit, believing in the truth of your word. Help us, oh God, tonight just to be where we need to be in relationship to you. It is in the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. If you would stand with me as Bruce leads, whatever decision, we'll be right here at the front. Pass me not, O gentle Savior, hear my humble cry, while on others thou art calling, do not pass me by. As we close tonight, just a reminder, this Wednesday night, all of the regular ministry activities, First Baptist, are, are all in full motion, uh, barring, you know, Snow Blizzard Part 2 or whatever may possibly happen. Next Sunday, not only do we have our normal Sunday morning service, next Sunday night, as I alluded to in the beginning, uh, all of our Sunday evening activities, whether it be respective Bible studies, student ministry, children's choir, everything, uh, is back to what we know as quote-unquote uh, normal. But next Sunday night is going to be a special Sunday night. Let me share with you why before we close. You may or may not know that on a cultural level, today is actually what we refer to as Sanctity of Life Sunday. Uh, this is the day that the Christian community sets aside uh, to recognize that the author of life and the giver of life has called us to honor and protect life. But it's also D-Now weekend. And so it's kind of an, an odd calendaring on, on our end. And so next Sunday, we're not only going to allude to that in the morning, but next Sunday night, uh, we're going to have a celebration of the sanctity of life. Uh, we're going to have uh, those uh, here as guests to help us understand that. And we're all